Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here. For those of you who are participating online, we're thankful that you've joined us as well. This morning we've gathered together to worship and to also focus on God as our creator. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, listen as I read Psalm 95. Let these words soak in. I'll try to read them slow so that you can grab hold of uh, Psalm 95 this morning. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. I want to encourage you to stand as we uh, declare and praise God for being a great and awesome God. me how 
You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We worship such a great God. And this morning, I hope that you're reminded of how great and sovereign he is. And if you do not know the power of the Lord, I hope that you don't leave this morning, but don't walk away from this morning knowing what power Jesus is in your life. So Lord, I just want to remind the congregation, all of you, about his sovereignty. Sing with us about his sovereignty. Turn. 
How many of you are thankful that God is sovereign over our lives, right? That this world is not out of control. That at the end of the day, the outcome doesn't depend on us. God is sovereignly working out his purposes and plans. And he's a good father. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can gather this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ to declare that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that, that you are above all. Lord, that you have no equal. Lord, I pray that this service indeed would exalt you. Lord, I, I thank you for Randy. I thank you, Lord, that he is a servant of yours. I thank you, Lord, for the gifts, the ability, the knowledge that you've given him. Lord, I pray that you would use him this morning to declare your glory through creation. Lord, so that our faith could be strengthened and so that you could draw individuals to yourself. Lord, we recognize this morning that individuals come into this room or they're participating online and they have heavy hearts. Lord, they have burdens that they've been carrying. Lord, they have uncertainty in their lives. Lord, they, they recognize that you are sovereign, but yet, Lord, they just don't see how the situation and circumstances are going to work out, Lord, for, for their good and for your glory. So, Lord, continue to give them the faith to trust you. Lord, may they stand on your promises. Lord, may they live from a place that's rooted and grounded in your nature and your character. Lord, we're thankful again to be able to be here this morning to worship your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Turn your attention to the screens. Hey everyone, I'm Tyler, and we are so glad that you're joining us today from wherever you are. Here are a few things you'll want to know about. Whether you're watching online or with us in person today, you can find all the service resources you'll need online. The message notes, program, scripture, connection card, and more are designed to help you interact with our services. You can find these in person or go to the top of our Facebook page or the blue buttons on our website. Have something on your heart that you'd like prayer for? Check out our connection card, which is in the pocket of the chair in front of you, or you can find it online. Our upcoming Next Steps class is on September 12th. Keep our eye out for more information or visit our website to register. Also beginning on Sunday, September 12th, we will be returning to two worship services, which will be held at 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. The second service will be live streamed at cbcpa.org. Regen is a support ministry that meets on Tuesday evenings from 7 to 9 p.m. New groups are launching Tuesday, August 31st, but you can begin attending at any time. For more information, visit our website at cbcpa.org support. Now let's listen to Pastor Jeff as he shares his thoughts on SEEK. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff, and I'm excited that the leadership of CBC is calling everyone to take seven days to pray, fast, and seek God, beginning Sunday, August 22nd through Saturday, August 28th. I know that each of you have busy schedules, and the thought of adding one more thing to your calendars each day can seem impossible or overwhelming. I need to confess that as we were preparing for a week of seek in January of this past year, I was not looking forward to the week. I was afraid that it would be a burden to my schedule and that I would find the week to be draining. But my experience was just the opposite. The seek times, whether they were in the morning or evening, were a blessing to me and left me energized. I came through the week spiritually refreshed and refueled. Instead of the week of seek being a burden, it was a huge blessing. So if you are not excited about setting aside time each day to seek God or feel as if you cannot add one more thing to your schedule, be encouraged. Even your pastor feels that way at times. But take it from me, make seeking God a priority the week of August 22nd through 28th 
and you will be glad you did. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That is an awesome promise. Again, thank you for joining us. Let's remember to love God, love others, and reach out this week. This is week two of a four-week sermon series on uh, science and the Bible. How many of you were able to uh, see or watch the uh, message last week because you were here or participated? So then you are uh, very aware of how blessed we are to have Randy Gaiman. For those of you not familiar with Randy, Randy was a science teacher for many years at Elizabethtown Middle School. He uh, then was a pastor at uh, Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and uh, now he's a science teacher at Dayspring Christian Academy. And uh, we are very, very blessed to have him here at CBC teaching us this morning, so let's give him a CBC welcome. Thank you, Randy. Well, good morning. It is good to be back with you again. And uh, if you were here last week, you may recall we talked about uh, science in the Bible and this uh, misconception that some people have that the Bible is over here and science is over here and the two can't come together. Uh, but in reality, science and the Bible fit together so beautifully. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the whole issue of creation versus evolution, kind of uh, an overview type of thing. And it's important that we do this because a lot of people have, uh, have misunderstandings of, of exactly what, what's going on. I think that's even illustrated uh, with this first slide. Uh, some people think that maybe I formatted this incorrectly. Uh, they think that the yellow line here should be a vertical line rather than a horizontal line, kind of like a wall or a fence. And you're either on one side or you're the other. You're either a creationist or you're an evolutionist. Uh, but what I found is that it's actually more of a spectrum and people fall all along this spectrum and actually move along this spectrum. Uh, last week, I shared with you a little bit my personal testimony. Raised in a Christian home, came, came to Christ at an early age, uh, believed that the Bible was true. And then my uh, middle school biology teacher telling me that uh, I needed to believe that I evolved from an ape-like ancestor. And trying to, to fit this together and figure out how this could work. And I, I started thinking that maybe God used evolution as his means of creating uh, it made sense to me, and I started to, to progress on this line toward the left. Uh, as I studied more over the years, as we talked about uh, last week, uh, that's really an untenable position uh, to say that God used evolution because uh, God can do anything except deny his character and nature. And evolution is a process that's trial and error. Evolution is a process that relies on death and disease and suffering, uh, and that is contrary to God's character and nature. And so uh, after I learned those things and started studying that there are a lot of problems with evolution, uh, I have moved back over firmly onto the right-hand side and have the, the privilege of teaching this to, uh, to students as, uh, as we talk about these things. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about this idea of evolution. Even, even to say those words, lots of different images probably come to your mind because uh, there's different types of evolution. We've got cosmic evolution, the idea of how the universe came into existence. We've got uh, organic evolution or chemical evolution, which is how um, life first started from non-living material. And then we have what's called biological evolution, and that's the idea of how uh, living things progressed once that first life somehow came to be. All of those are unique in and of themselves. They have their own problems. Uh, we're going to be focusing today on biological evolution. And if I brought uh, evolutionists in here today and lined them up front, let's say I've had 20 of them, and had them explain what they believe about evolution, uh, we'd probably get about 20 different answers uh, as far as their uh, explanation. You see, there's no one theory of evolution. Uh, it's kind of a general idea with a lot of nuances and a lot of different ideas and a lot of different hypotheses all wrapped up in this. So I'm going to try to generalize things a little bit and uh, just kind of give you what we might call a kind of a generic uh, idea of evolution. Um, we could start going back, they would say, 4.6 billion years ago when the earth had just recently formed. It was this hot molten mass and uh, gradually over a long period of time was cooling off. It was being pelted by comets. Comets, which are primarily made of ice, would bring all of this water to the planet. Eventually, the oceans formed. Uh, within the oceans, chemicals are bumping together like chemicals do. Uh, energy supply maybe by geothermal sources or lightning. And eventually, the very first life came to be. 
And then we're told over the last three and a half billion years that this life gradually changed and developed and became all of the different types of living things that we see on the planet today. It's kind of a, a generic idea of evolution. A lot of people, when you say evolution, immediately think of Charles Darwin. Uh, and some people refer to him as the father of evolution, as if he came up with the idea. But actually, there were evolutionary ideas long before Darwin. Darwin is famous because he came up with a mechanism to try to explain how evolution might have occurred. He called it natural selection. You might refer to it as survival of the fittest. And uh, his idea there was that as we have differences within populations, certain animals or plants would be able to survive better than others. They would survive, pass on their traits to their offspring, and, and through many, many years, millions of years, uh, lots of different things could happen. Uh, he drew this little diagram in his journal and suggested that this down here was the very beginning life form, and then it gradually developed and diversified and branched out. Uh, and we take that diagram and pretty much use it today when we talk about the tree of evolution. This is a, a simplified tree that might be found in an elementary school textbook or maybe a middle school textbook. Uh, but the main point is that all of the different types of living things all go back to a common starting point, a common ancestor uh, three and a half billion years ago. This is the generic or general idea of evolution. The idea of creation, of course, is very different. The idea of creation says that there is a creator who made all things. Uh, we believe that creator had power and intelligence, and as we look at the world around us, we see beauty, we see complexity, we see organization, we see design. And so not everybody who is a creationist is a Christian or necessarily even a Bible believer, but someone who believes that there is a God or force or something that created. Uh, some of those people don't know who or what that creative force or person was, but as a biblical creationist, I believe that the creator's the God who is described in the Bible, the one who has revealed himself to us. And so with that understanding of this great difference between these two views, uh, people will sometimes then ask me, well, which one does science fit best? Uh, how do the facts line up with creation? How do the facts line up with evolution? And even the fact that somebody asks that question kind of shows that they misunderstand the nature of this whole argument. You see, a lot of people believe that the creationists are out there running around looking for creation facts. And the evolutionists are out there running around looking for evolution facts. And whoever finds the most facts is going to win. Uh, but that's not really the way that it works. You see, we live in the same world. We have the same facts. Um, here's a fossil that I show my students. It happens to be about 17 fish on this little piece of rock. They're all fish known as nitea. And um, uh, this is a fact. But it's not a creation fact. And it's not an evolution fact. It's just a fact. It's a, it's a fossil. And then this fossil has to be interpreted and this is where the battle arises. It's not in the facts themselves, but it's in the interpretation of those facts. You see, everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a way in which they look at things. And your worldview is very much like a pair of glasses or a lens through which you look to analyze and understand things. So if you start with the ideas of man, you're going to use that as your lens to take a look at anything, and that's how you're going to interpret it. But if you start with Scripture, and Scripture becomes your lens, then you're going to use that for the basis of your thinking. You're going to look through that lens, and you're going to interpret things differently. I tell my students that what we need to do is develop a biblical worldview. And we talked about this at the end of the service. I'm going to mention again at the end of this service the fact that God knows everything. Therefore, He's the only one with perfect perception of reality. So the closer we get our minds to thinking like his word, the more likely we are to get things right. We're going to see things correctly. And that applies to everything, including things like fossils. And it's important that we talk about fossils because uh, a lot of people use that as evidence for evolution. Uh, some people say to me sometimes, oh, you know, I don't have time to study all this stuff like you have. I, I haven't spent 40 years looking at this, or, but I have this neighbor who believes in evolution. Sometimes we get into these discussions and I, I don't know what to say. Well, you don't need to, to study all these things in depth and know all the details. Um, we just need to know how to ask some questions. Uh, this actually comes from the book Tactics by Greg Kokel, who uh, uh, talks about putting a stone in people's shoe, uh, causing them something to just bother their thinking. 
If somebody says that they take a more scientific view of life and they believe in evolution, just ask them, first of all, well, what do you mean by that? When you say you believe in evolution, can you explain it to me? Right there, that's a problem for a lot of people. They really don't know much about evolution. They, they really can't explain it. And so you're starting to put a stone in their shoe. They're starting to realize that, wow, I, I believe in something and I can't even explain it. And then you could say to them, well, can you tell me, please, what, what evidence do you find most compelling for evolution? And many will look at you like a deer in headlights. Most compelling evidence. Uh, uh, and they don't have an answer. You're not doing this to be mean. You're not doing this to trick them. You're doing this to try to help them understand that they have bought into these ideas because they've been told that they are true, not because there's any great solid evidence for it. And so if they do possibly uh, give an example of evidence, they'll probably mention fossils. It's the number one answer probably. And then you just ask another simple question. Oh, that's interesting. Can you tell me please what fossils do you find especially compelling to support evolution? And once again, this look of terror will cross their eyes. And, and again, we're not trying to be mean, we're trying to help people understand that so many believe for no reason at all, they have just believed because they've been told to. Now, if they do happen to mention something and you don't know, maybe Tiktaalik or something like that, uh, then you could say, well, I'm not real familiar with that. Let me do a little bit of research. Maybe we can discuss that later. And then you can start researching that. But what we want to do is cause people to understand that science does not necessarily support evolution. There's this idea that all scientists are evolutionists. That couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, when we are talking about fossils, here you can see a couple scientists uh, digging at Dinosaur National Monument out in western part of the United States, a place where a whole bunch of dinosaur fossils are all piled together uh, as if swept there by some massive flood or something. And uh, mixed in with these dinosaur bones, we've got snails and freshwater clams. A lot of people aren't aware of that. And uh, they are amazing things to study, these, these fossils. Keep in mind what we said last week. Ken Ham says that if you look at the world around us and you start digging around, what do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Exactly what we should find if there was a worldwide flood. And so we, we look at these, and we have found hundreds of billions of fossils. Uh, many of them are still uncatalogued, sitting in university warehouses, waiting for somebody to have opportunity to look at them. They are just all over the place. But fossils are very significant. Uh, I'll ask my students to make scientific observations for this fossil. I'll stand up front and say, make scientific observations. And some kid will say something about the coloration. Another kid will mention maybe the, the shape or the size. And then there's usually somebody, generally the class clown in the back of the room, who will shout out, it's dead. And I say, excellent scientific observation. You are correct. It is dead. Every fossil that I've ever studied is dead. That's important. I asked the students, what does that tell you then about when this fossil formed? And they'll think for a few moments and say, well, it had to form after Adam and Eve sinned. That's right, because I require my students to memorize Romans 5.12, which tells us that through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin. We talked about this last week. When you're looking at a fossil, you are looking at death. And that came as a result of man's sin. So this idea that fossils existed hundreds of millions of years before man, there's no way. Because death is a result of man's sin. Not just in Romans 5, we said Romans 8 last week as well. It says the whole universe was subjected to frustration. And if you're still not convinced, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is crystal clear. It's talking about physical death, not spiritual death. Because it's talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then also says that Adam is the one that brought this death into the world. It's obviously talking about physical death. And so fossils are significant because they show us a lot of death. In fact, we find lots of fossils often all piled together. This is a museum display I took a picture of years ago. Again, lots of things together. I tell students, if you find a fossil, keep digging. You're likely to find more. Almost never do you find a, a single fossil in isolation. Uh, and some of the fossils are just beautiful. Check this one out. This is on display at the Creation Museum out in Kentucky. You can see a fossil of a fish eating a fish. Now, when I went to school, I was told that an animal dies... In the case of a fish, it would sink to the bottom of the lake. It would slowly get buried up by sand and sediment and over a long period of time eventually form into a fossil. That doesn't make any sense. 
Take a look at this fossil. It is beautifully uh, preserved. This animal was right in the middle of its lunch when it was instantaneously covered with mud and sand being carried by water. This is the way we find fossils. I mean, how long do you think a dead fish like this is going to last laying on the bottom of a lake? Scavengers are going to come in and rip the thing apart. Bacteria is going to cause it to start to rot. Even secular scientists admit today that for most of the fossils, rapid burial was required. Uh, this, by the way, is not a unique fossil. Here's another fossil of a fish eating a fish in a photograph of the same type of activity. But the background of this slide is also showing a fossil of great interest. This is an animal known as an ichthysaur, a marine reptile. Uh, it's only showing the back end of the animal because it's showing the most important part. We've got a baby ichthysaur being born. It's about 95% out of the birth canal. Again, this is not a, a mama that had trouble during birth and died and went to the bottom of the ocean floor and gradually was buried up. This was an ichthysaur in the process of giving birth and it was almost complete when, bam, suddenly she was covered with tons of mud and sand and sediment being carried by water. This is the way we find fossils, these amazingly, beautifully preserved creatures. Uh, this is one of those creatures, Archaeopteryx, one of the most famous fossils in the world. How many of you have heard of Archaeopteryx? Uh, it is in every biology textbook that I have ever looked at. Uh, for decades. It's always there. Uh, we've only found about 11 specimens of Archaeopteryx, all of them in Germany. Uh, but what this was, was a, a unique animal. Here's how artists have uh, tried to uh, reconstruct the thing. Uh, we don't know if it had a blue face or green feathers. That's artistic license there. Uh, but what we see is that this was a strange animal. It was a bird. It had wings. It had feathers. Uh, but it also has some strange features which many people try to say are reptile-like. And this has been used already as a transitional form between reptile and bird. Now, many evolutionists today say Archaeopteryx was not transitional, and yet uh, it continues to be presented that way in many textbooks. And so you see things like teeth in the mouth, supposedly left over from the reptile ancestor. You th see things like claws on the wings, and we're told those are left over from the, the front legs of a, a reptile ancestor. Some other features we could talk about, but, but are these really reptile features? I mean, teeth... It's not a reptile characteristic. Some fish have teeth, some do not. Some amphibians have teeth, some do not. Some mammals have teeth, some do not. Some reptiles have teeth, some do not. Some birds had teeth, most did not. It's just a feature that we find in every major animal group. What about claws on the wings? Aren't they left over from the front legs of the reptile ancestor? Well, no, not necessarily. There are animals alive today that have claws on the wings. Uh, this animal here knows the Watsin in South America. Its young have claws on the wing. The Torico found in Africa, juveniles also have claws on the wings. And a lot of people don't realize that even the ostrich has three claws on each wing. Yet nobody is saying that the ostrich is part reptile or is somehow transitional or it's evolving from reptiles. It's recognized to be 100% true bird. Interesting, all of these birds have feathers, and we'll talk more about that uh, in two weeks from today. Uh, but these feathers, we are told, evolve from reptile scales. Um, how does that work? You see, scales are nothing more than folds in the skin. These are uh, from a, a snake uh, under a microscope. If we look at a fossil or a, a feather under a microscope, we can see that it is this beautifully organized, detailed structure. It's not based on folds in the skin. It actually grows out of a follicle like a hair, but then it unfurls to reveal this complexity. You've got your central rachis. You've got the barbs that branch off the rachis. You've got smaller structures that come off the barbs called barbules. If you look at those little barbules under a microscope, they have little microscopic hooks which attach to the barbule right next door. What an amazing structure. Very, very different from reptile scales. Like I said, we'll talk about that in, in two weeks. What I want to focus on is this concept of flight. Because we're told by the evolutionists that flight evolved four separate times. We're told that it evolved in the birds, that it evolved in the reptiles, the, the pterodons, that it evolved in the mammals, such as the bats, and it evolved in the insects. Each of these different lines of evolution should have taken, we are told, at least 40 million years. So we have a total of 160 million years of evolution or more. So there should be lots of fossil evidence to show us how these creatures evolved over time from non-flying animals into flying animals. But the reality is, no, we don't have the fossils. You know, we have fossils of birds, but they all have wings. We've got fossils of pterodons, but they all have completely developed wings. We don't see partially developed wings 
Our oldest fossils of bats look pretty much like bats today. And insects, we have fossils of insects with wings, and we have fossils with insects without wings, just like insects today. You would think after 160 million years of evolution that we'd have a lot of fossils. It'd be interesting to see even one fossil of an insect supposedly evolving its wings, but it's just not there. The fossil evidence doesn't support this idea. Uh, years ago, I was down at the Smithsonian Washington, took this picture. They had a display. It's not there anymore. They've replaced it a number of times. It was called the Dynamics of Evolution. As you walked out, you saw this big 30-foot-high mural on the evolution of the horse, and you were told that the horse began as this little guy down here known as Hyracotherium and gradually evolved up to the modern-day Equus today. And then to support their view, they have a, a display case that shows a number of different fossils and... Uh, we're told that this little dude down here had a lot of toes and up here just one toe. And, and it, it looks very convincing. It appears in textbooks uh, and has pretty much in every textbook I've ever looked at. But the Smithsonian forgot to mention a few basic facts that would have been really helpful. For one thing, they didn't tell you that these things are not found in this developmental order. Uh, we often find these animals mixed together in the same strata. Based on evolutionary thinking, that means they lived at the same time. A case where one of the descendants is found in rock strata before its supposed ancestor. That's like you living before your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. You don't have to be a biologist to know that that's just not possible. Uh, the number of ribs is changing constantly back and forth going through this sequence. Uh, the number of lumbar vertebrae is constantly changing. A lot of problems with this idea. And yet it is presented as this nice linear progression that everybody knows and recognizes the evolution of the horse. Uh, Dr. Raup from the Field Museum of Chicago made this statement. He says, some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. What appeared to be a nice, simple progression when relatively few data were available now appears to be much more complex and much less gradualistic. In other words, what he's saying is, you know, we show it in the textbooks and in the museums to be this nice linear progression. That's not the way it is. Actually, there's over 12 different family trees that have been developed to try to explain the evolution of the horse, and they don't agree with each other. Uh, that shows how mixed up the, the, uh, the thinking is on this. Um, What's I find interesting is uh, you might stand there and say, oh, wow, that means uh, they're going to change the museum soon or they're going to change the textbook soon. Uh, probably not. He made this comment back in 1979. And yet today, continually, new textbooks are being published that show this nice progression of the horse. Uh, here's a museum display that I took a picture of just about three, four years ago. Again, nice, easy progression. But that's not the way evolutionists view it. In fact, some evolutionists, to their credit, even say that the textbooks and museums have it all wrong. So we need to understand that even the way things are presented aren't necessarily accurate, even to the evolutionist thinking. When it comes to horses, there's tremendous variety in horses. You've got the, the tiny little Falabella up to the mighty Clydesdale. Uh, just because there's size differences, that doesn't mean that it's a horse. I think a lot of those fossils we were looking at are all types of horses, but not necessarily progression, one evolving into another. In fact, to understand this, we have to look at what Scripture says. In Genesis 1.25, we read this. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Ten times the word kinds is used in Genesis chapter 1 alone. This is the way God created things. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply after your kind. So what exactly is a kind? Well, it's best explained probably this way. God, I don't believe, made the Orlov Trotter, the Timidor, the Dale, the Tarpon, the Arab, the Four Pony, the Pinto, the Falabella. God didn't make all these different breeds of horses. He made horses. And from those original horses that God created, developed these various different breeds. Now, some people will say, wait, 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 isn't that evolution? No, not at all. This is variation within a created kind. Notice, you start with horses, they continue to be horses, and they always will be horses. They're not changing into some other kind of animal. I think of it this way. If you take a donkey and a horse and you breed them together, you can get a mule. Take a zebra and a donkey, breed it together, you can get a z-donk or a zonkey. Uh, take a zebra and a horse and breed them together, you get a zorse. 
The fact that you can take a zebra and a horse and breed them together and get viable offspring, I think is good evidence that they're in the same created kind. A lot of variation, but they're still horses. The same is true with other created kinds. Here are two fossils that, or skulls that I show to students. I have the actual skulls that I uh, display and I ask the students to guess what they are and they come up with all kinds of various different ideas. In reality, they're both types of dogs, St. Bernard and an English Bulldog. Yet they're incredibly different in the way they look. And yet these are considered to be in the same species. Many of you own dogs in your home. Did you know that the breed of dog you have in your house probably only came into existence within the last 100 years? It's an amazing thing. God created dogs, maybe the original dog being something like a wolf, and then from that original dog developed all the different types of dogs that we have today. Again, not evolution. They were dogs, they are dogs, they always will be dogs. This is simply variation within a created kind. Dogs are a great example of a created kind being able to have tremendous diversity. Uh, cats would be a good example as well. You take a male lion, female tiger, breed them together, you get a liger. You see, once you understand this, it answers some of the questions that people struggle with. How could Noah take all those animals on board the ark? How could Adam name all of those animals in one day? You see, Noah did not need to take a lion, a tiger, a cheetah, a puma, a panther, a leopard. He didn't need to take all of those different cats. He took a couple of cats. And from those cats later developed the lion and tiger and cheetah and puma and panther and leopard and bobcat and lynx. And, right? So this created kind is very, very important. Uh, here are some fossils of dinosaur skulls at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. They all belong to a group we know as Ceratopsia. Uh, it's disagreed whether or not there were actually this many ceratops. Some believe uh, that what we're seeing is sexual dimorphism, meaning that males and females appear differently, and some of these might be male or female. Uh, some also suggest that some of these were juveniles and others were the adult form. Uh, we don't know. They're extinct. But what we do know is that there's at least some variety, and God didn't need to create all of these individual types. He created the ceratops kind. And just like dogs and cats, there could be variety. But notice, they didn't change into something else. They remained ceratops. Uh, Darwin has an idea kind of like this, but he didn't seem to follow it through or understand how that might play into what Scripture says. See, Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, and he talks a lot about the finches that he saw there. And many people are familiar with Darwin's finches. Darwin's idea was that on these volcanic islands, that originally, a pair of finches was blown there, maybe by a storm or something. And then the offspring of these finches later developed into the various types of finches we find there today. Some with big, thick beaks, some with smaller, thin beaks. And many people will talk about this being evidence of evolution. No, this is evidence of variation in a created kind. Notice, they're not changing into another type of animal. They're not even changing into another type of bird. They're still finches. But Darwin suggested that if given enough time, these animals could change into a different kind of animal. And that's where I would disagree with him. And that's where we have no evidence of that happening. I would challenge you to listen when evolutionists speak and look at the examples that they give. When they talk about examples that we can see evolution occurring, they're always giving examples of things within a created kind. These small changes and variety in the same kind of animal. But we never hear of evidence going from one kind of living thing to a different kind of living thing. That evidence does not exist, especially in the fossil record. Oh, by the way, a little side note here for those of you that have a science background and you understand taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, uh, kind, we believe, fits somewhere right around the family level. Not exactly, because this taxonomy, that's a construct of man, whereas the kind is God's design, uh, but it gives us an idea about where that fits. But even Darwin recognized that fossils do not support this idea of one kind of thing changing into another. Darwin wrote, Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum, layer of rock, full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. Darwin was saying, I understand that the fossils don't support my theory. But he firmly believed that someday we would find fossils and his theory would be vindicated by the fossil record. But here we are over 160 years later and we still haven't found those fossils that show the nice, finely graduated organic chain, as he says. 
Well, fossils aren't the only thing evolutionists talk about. This is also in every biology textbook I've ever looked at, the idea of homology. And homology is the idea of what we sometimes call similar structures. Uh, for instance, if you look at your arm, you've got three bones in your arm. You've got your humerus, your ulna, and your radius. If you look at a cat, humerus, ulna, radius. Dog, humerus, ulna, radius. Bat, humerus, ulna, radius. Lots of animals have that same three-bone design. Notice the fact and the interpretation. The fact is, a lot of critters have the same three-bone design. Interpretation, we evolved from a common ancestor that had those three bones. This is where we've got that argument taking place over the interpretation. The fact is not debated. Only the interpretation, using that idea of evolution to say it must be from a common ancestor. And yet there's another interpretation, and that is that there's a common designer. Just like an architect today will sometimes develop a, a design plan and, and materials that work together really well. He doesn't use it in just one building, but we use it in a series of buildings, altering the design to fit the particular needs of his client. In the same way here, the great architect, the master designer, came up with a plan that works really, really well. He didn't use it in just one critter, he used it in a bunch of different kinds of animals, altering the design to fit the particular needs of that organism. And that's what we see as we look through Scripture. We interpret everything being created by God. It should not bother us to see similarities. They come from the same created mind. By the way, if this was our high school biology class that I teach, we would then go on and talk about some other problems with this. Um, these different structures, while similar in design, uh, come from different gene bases. And you would expect if it came from a common ancestor that we'd have the same genes coding for these structures. They follow different development developmental pathways, and, uh, but we don't have time to get into all that today. Uh, vestigial structures, also, every textbook I've ever looked at, vestigial structures. Uh, Funk and Wagnalls defines vestige as a part of organ, small and degenerate, but well-developed and functional and ancestral forms of organisms. In other words, something found in a plant or animal's body that doesn't do anything. It's just kind of a leftover from the past. Now, I say that, and I know already what has popped into your head. Not because I have ESPN or anything, it's just this is what always pops into people's heads. You were thinking the appendix, weren't you? Be honest, raise your hand if you were thinking appendix. Yeah, a lot of them. Okay, this is the appendix right here. Small finger-like projection at the base of the large intestine. Uh, doesn't appear to have any function, we've been told, and yet uh, there it is. And so the suggestion is that we evolved from an ancestor that used this appendix somehow in digestion. But because of changes in our diet and millions of years of evolution, the appendix is now shriveled up, just this little thing which a million years from now maybe won't even be there anymore. Um, that's the very common view of vestigial structures. When I started doing these talks uh, back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, um, I also talked about the tonsils because tonsils used to be considered vestigial. But by the point I was doing my talks, they weren't anymore. Uh, I was invited once to speak up in Harrisburg to a group. I thought I was going to speak to a youth group. Uh, when I got there, I think the youngest person in the room was like 75. Um, and you generally speak to youth groups and senior citizens groups just a little bit differently. Um, but I used that opportunity to ask that group of seniors, there's about 50, 60 of them there, I asked them, how many of you had your tonsils removed before age 13? About two-thirds of them raised their hand. I used the number 13 because that was the age of the students that I was teaching that year. And so then the next day when I went into the classroom, I had five classes, total of about 125 kids, and I asked them, how many of you have had your tonsils removed? Out of 125 kids, there might have been three or four that raised their hand. You see, back when these seniors were young, the tonsils were considered to be vestigial. So if your throat got a little bit red, they took you to the hospital, hacked out your tonsils, you don't need them anyway. But by the time these students got to that age, we now know that tonsils play an important role in helping fight disease. And so now we don't remove the tonsils unless absolutely necessary. And I remember saying back in the late 70s, early 80s, that I believe the same thing is true with the appendix, that someday we will discover a purpose for the appendix. Well, that day has arrived. We now know what the appendix does. We know that the appendix serves as a repository for helpful bacteria. If you have a terrible case of diarrhea, can I say that in church? If you have a terrible case of diarrhea and you totally empty out your colon, it is the colony that's inside your appendix that will repopulate your gut with this helpful bacteria. It also now is believed, I just read an article from Scientific American uh, this week, uh, it's also now believed that it's part of the immune system and so also plays a role in being involved with fighting disease, especially among younger children and it deteriorates that, that 
function as, as you get older. See, when you find something that we don't know what its purpose is, the evolutionists, because it's their preconceived idea that we evolved from something else, they just automatically default to this must be vestigial, something left over. But if you come from the point of view that God is intelligent and he designed things well, if we find something and we don't know what it does, maybe it's more a measure of our ignorance than it is for any type of evidence for evolution. But things do change. We know that they change. And here's uh, how they change is based on, on chromosomes. Here you're looking at some chromosomes actually of a fruit fly, dark and light stripes. You can see the, the genes on there. And we know that things are, are changing. Uh, one way that they, they change is simply what's called genetic variation. Uh, you've seen this already, maybe in a, a litter of puppies. where you can have a, a dog give birth to a bunch of puppies and they all look different from one another. Not only their appearance, but their personality, their physical abilities can vary. That is just normal, genetic variation. But we also have something called mutations. And mutations is where there's something that takes place in the DNA, a sudden change. In this case, uh, an albino monkey that uh, you know, normally is kind of a brown color, but this guy, complete with pink eyes, lost the ability to produce skin pigmentation. And this is a mutation. We've actually studied fruit flies in great depth for mutations because they're easy to mutate. Give a little bit of chemical or a little um, radiation and fruit flies produce a lot of mutations. We've cataloged over 5,000 mutations in fruit flies. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but we'll just mention a couple. Uh, one of which is size. This is the dwarf mutation in a fruit fly. Uh, some have to do with eye color. Normally, a fruit fly has red eyes, but white or black eye mutations have been developed. Um, normally, the eye covers almost half the head, but this is known as bar eye, and this is called vestigial eye. Remember vestigial structures? Uh, some of the mutations affect the wings. This is a curly wing fruit fly. I tell my kids they can only fly loop-to-loops, actually can't fly at all, and uh, this guy can't either, vestigial wing. See, all of these mutations are things that are harmful to the fly. But evolution says that if we look at mutations over time, whereas, whereas there are some that are harmful and some that are neutral, there are going to have to be some that are beneficial. There has to be. I mean, think how many mutations it would take to change a bacterium to an elephant over hundreds of millions of years. There has to be a lot of new mutations that were beneficial, producing more efficient organisms, stronger organisms. We're told by the evolutionists that these mutations increased the genetic information. This is the hero of evolution, mutation and time. Given enough time, there'll be enough mutations that we can get this new genetic information. Some major problems with that. But just think for a minute, going from a, a reptile to a bird, how many mutations would have had to be involved in that? It's not just scales turning into feathers. It's changing the skeletal structure, the muscular structure, the nervous system structure, the respiratory structure, the, the circulatory system. All these things have to change. And there have to be mutations all along the process. And those mutations have to give some survival benefit to the organism. Now, this museum display says that this fish evolved into this land animal because of mutation and natural selection. Lots of mutations along the way, they provided a survival benefit, and so one critter could evolve into another critter. By the way, I tell my students that if you ever see a diagram like this or a chart where you see an arrow, in your mind write in the words, no fossils found here. Because you can be sure if there was a fossil right here between these two guys, they would put them on the chart. And they chose these two because of homology, some similarities of this guy and some similarities in this guy. But again, we already said that doesn't necessarily mean common ancestor. Uh, this is the way they show birds evolving from a reptile ancestor. But there are no fossils on these major branches or even the minor branches. Take away the tree and you just have a bunch of birds. And fossil or uh, mutations often can be harmful as well. This is a two-headed calf that was born here in Lancaster County. Died a couple years or a couple hours after death. That sounded good. A couple hours after birth. Sorry, I just looked at the clock and I'm trying to rush here. A couple hours after birth and it died. A harmful mutation, obviously. And uh, disproves that old adage that two heads are better than one, clearly. Um, something that, that's not good. Same thing here. Obviously, a harmful mutation. Vestigial wing fruit fly. But what about eye color? Is that harmful? Well, some scientists actually studied this and found that if given a choice, a female fruit fly will not mate with a white-eyed male. She'll only mate with a red-eyed male. Therefore, it would be considered harmful because they would not pass that on to their offspring. So think about this. If you're going from a reptile to a bird, to go from a reptile with good legs to a bird with good wings, first you're going to have to go 
from a reptile with good legs probably to a reptile with not so good legs, to a bird with not so good wings, and eventually you get to the bird with good wings. Somewhere along that process, the animal's not going to be able to escape its predators or get to its food. Creationists predict that mutations result in reduced fertility, like the white-eyed fruit fly. Uh, reduced efficiency, like a curly-winged fruit fly not able to fly. In some cases, outright death, like the two-headed calf. And creation predicts that when we have mutations, a lot of those are going to result in a loss of information. This is critical. I tell my students, this is where the argument is right now. It's all about information. The evolutionists cannot give us evidence of an increase of information due to mutations. And this is a major problem for the evolutionists. See, evolution requires an improvement. It requires an increase of information. Whereas creation says things stay basically the same. When there is a change, it's usually a downhill change. And those things tend to not survive quite as well. We started with this diagram saying that this kind of represents the theory of evolution from a common ancestor, all living things develop. Now this is very simplified. Uh, perhaps a, a more accurate view is this one here. But it's still basically the same right here in the center, a common ancestor. And from that branches out all of these different types of living things that we have in the world today. And this is their view. This is their interpretation of the variety we see in the world around us. But the creationist has a different interpretation. We believe in what's called an orchard. We still use trees to illustrate the history of life, but we believe that God created different kinds of living things. And certainly there is variety. Certainly there is change that takes place within a kind. But one kind never changes into another kind. This is what we see in experience. That we see dogs can vary. They can, they can change from one breed and, and breed them with another and get something new but they never change into something other than a dog. And so these created kinds that God talks about in Genesis chapter 1, hugely significant. As we look at all these things, I just would finish by uh, reminding you that the world we live in is beautiful. It is complex. It is organized. It shows clear design. It shows beauty. And Paul wrote to the Romans saying that for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In other words, no one's going to be able to stand before the throne of God and say, I didn't know you existed. He will say, did you fall asleep in biology class? Did you not study the world that I've made? It was clear for you to see. Ladies and gentlemen, God has given us his word, and because he has given it to us, it is authoritative. I said last week, God knows everything, therefore he's the only one with perfect perception of reality. The closer we get our minds to thinking like this book, the more likely we are to get things right. The more divergent we are from our thinking with this book, the more likely we are to get things wrong. You have a choice to make. You can believe the fallible ideas of man, science textbooks that we have to reprint every year because we keep finding mistakes. Or you can believe the unchanging word of God. For me, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to base my life and my belief on this book. And I encourage you to do the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is true. Thank you that it is reliable. Thank you that it is trustworthy. And I pray again for this congregation and for this church that you would bless them and give them a firm commitment to your word. I pray that you would deepen their faith strengthen their resolve, and that you would help them as they reach out to others around them to proclaim the truth of your word, pointing people toward Jesus Christ. For we pray in his name. Amen. Please stand with us.
How many of you believe that the universe declares God's majesty? Right? Amen. We recognize that uh, this topic is uh, something that individuals have many questions about. So uh, the fourth week of the sermon series, August 22nd, Randy is going to take time to answer your questions. And so if you have questions, there's the number that you need to uh, text your question to. And so uh, take advantage of the opportunity to uh, take down that number and later today, this week, uh, text uh, that number, the question, and he will respond to it on August 22nd. Also, I want to remind you by the Welcome Center, we have a resource table and uh, multiple books back there. This is uh, one of them, the Bible, How Do We Know It Can Be Trusted?, Noah's Ark, a biblical and scientific look at the Genesis account, and Dinosaurs, is there a biblical explanation? And so uh, please take advantage of the opportunity to stop back at that resource table, pick up these books and others. We'd uh, want to ask you if you can to cover the cost, which is $5. Also, uh, Randy has uh, written a book, Fossil Secrets. And uh, he's going to be down front here uh, in just a moment, and uh, you can uh, pick up this book for $5 as well. It has uh, some of the pictures, some of the information that you've heard today. If you're like me, it was like drinking out of a fire hydrant. I want to just like process through that a little bit slower. Uh, This book will uh, give you the ability to do so. Um, Mike and Bonnie Kleinhans are available at our prayer station uh, this morning. We recognize that there's tough stuff going on in our lives, so if uh, you're in need of prayer this morning, take advantage of that. If you're participating online, there's hosts who will be willing to uh, pray with you at this time as well. I'll be down here at the next steps. We'd love to greet you if you're new to Community Bible Church. Maybe you've been here a couple weeks, a couple months. Haven't had the opportunity to introduce yourself. I'd love to meet you. Uh, Also, uh, if you're interested in taking your next step uh, here at Community Bible Church, I can talk to you about that. Uh, In just a moment, I'll dismiss you. I want each of you to have a host mindset, whether it's your first time here or whether you've been 50 years. A host mindset is one that looks around, looks to welcome and include others. So, When I dismiss you, look around and introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know real well. But let me send you out with this benediction. Now to the King Eternal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.